John chapter 20. John chapter 20. So. John chapter 20. Verse 19 and following, we're continuing on learning and studying about the power of the resurrection. The more you study it and look at it, it's just amazing how different things kind of pop up throughout the story. I'm still just amazed as I think about that the fact is that the scriptures are very, very, not very informative, is that what Jesus did for those 40 days before he ascended. He, we got a few stories in there, but basically... There's a lot of time, and I do believe, as I, I think I mentioned either this morning or last week, is that I do believe that Jesus spent that time to invest and really drive home those, those life lessons that they were going to need that once he left and what they were going to have to deal with. And uh, the value of spending that quality time. And um, I do believe that that's missing nowadays is the aspect of quality time. You know, when we were kids and um, when we didn't have all the distractions or everything is that turn off the television. We had no cell phones. We had one phone. Mom and dad answered it. We as kids were not to touch it. And But we talked and have family over. Uh, I mean, you talked and you listened and the fact of you develop relationships. Nowadays, we live in a society where our minds are here, there, and yonder, so distracted that really, really the aspect of deep, lasting relationships is just not there everything's very shallow and uh we're just too busy and we got too many other things on our mind too many distractions and uh but i do believe that during that time jesus said i want to really hone in on some things things that i taught but you really didn't get the lessons so i want to make sure you get them because you're going to deal with some things i'm sure he revealed to them some things that they were going to have to deal with uh after he left so John chapter 20, verse 19 says this. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he, had thus, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said, said unto them, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand to the side, I will not believe. He was so hard-hearted that he wasn't even going to listen to the testimony of the other disciples. He says, I will not believe. Unless I get my conditions met, it's not going to happen. And I believe that as Christians, sometimes we have all these things, well, unless this and this and this happen, I won't believe that God can do anything. Well, God doesn't work that way. God's not in the negotiation business. Is that he is God, we are his creation, and what he says goes. And so when Thomas said, unless I have all these things happen to me, it's just not going to happen. I'm not going to believe. Can you imagine? Um, I know if I was in that room, I'd be saying, what are you talking about? Did you not see all these different things? Were you? I mean, were you that blind or so selfish that you didn't think about what all's going on? What's going on in your little head? Now, I don't know why he would think that. Maybe because of what he did saw that uh, it bothered him that much to where, he, I mean, a, a crisis of faith. I do know people that when they have, you think they have strong faith and then something horrible happened that they, they, think they start doubting God. God, if you're so loving, why would you let this happen? If you're so loving, why do you under, why did you allow me to be hurt? Why did my family have this situation? Had this situation uh, when I was in, in Bible college? We had a family that were coming. They were coming back to college after Christmas break, and they were driving through Chicago. 
uh, on one of the busiest freeways, the Dan Ryan Expressway. And uh, as they were coming there almost into Hammond, Indiana, something fell off the back of a truck. They ran over it. It uh, basically sliced the gas tank and caught it on fire. On, the only person that made it was the husband. Now, he got burned up pretty bad, and the, and the firemen, they took him to the hospital and everything. And literally after that, he struggled for a while as he felt guilty. Why did, why did they die and I didn't get to die? Why was it not fair that they got to do that, have to go through that, and I have to suffer this stuff and think about it? So he went through that time for about a year, year and a half, but um, he came around after a while just with the Lord's help and a lot of counseling, a lot of prayer, a lot of grace, and a lot of, a lot of mercy, God and God's people ministering to him. Because, you know, when you go through that, it's not, you can't just say, just get over it. You've got to believe God. That type of mentality sounds great, but would you have that type of strength to be able to not wonder uh, about what happened? So we're looking at humanity here. And so last week we talked about the fact is that Jesus reassured them. He says, um, verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. He reached into thy hand and thrust it in my side and be not faithless, but believing. So even Jesus understood the situation. He said, okay, I'm going to show you by my, so put your hands right there. Put your hand right there. And if it, that's what it takes for you to believe, then believe. So he reassured them. But then also after he reassured them, he commissions them. He says, okay, this is the purpose of it. Now look at verse 21. It says this. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. How many times does the word fear not, uh, peace, 365 times, because God is always reminding us no matter how bad things are, he's with us because he's with us. There's no reason to allow our emotions to get out of check. It says, peace be unto you. Then he says, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. So as I came down from heaven to live these 33 years on this earth, for the last three and a half years I've ministered to you, now as my Father sent me and I've done everything I'm supposed to do, now you're up on, on deck and you've got to do what, I, what I'm, I've commissioned you to do. So he commissions them. As believers, the moment that we get saved, we are commissioned. And as I mentioned this morning, it's just to use your life. I think sometimes that we have been so precise and specific regarding ministry, that we forget that God uses a variety of different techniques and a variety of different types of people to help minister in so many different ways. And so when it says, as my father sent me, so send I you, is that when I talk about a broken heart behind every door, and I talk about using your life issues to minister to other people because we relate better with our life than many times what we say. And so the aspect he reassured them that he commissions them is that I want you to continue on. Basically, I've invested these three and a half years in you. I want you to take what I've given to you and I want you to go with it. It does no good just holding on to it. The Christian life is not meant to be a dam to hold everything up and, and enjoy it but we're supposed to be a channel. And the purpose of a channel is to be dispersed so that this way what God gives to us, it, is, it ministers to many other people. And uh, being a giver. Uh, there's two types of people in, the, people in this world, givers and takers. If we're supposed to be like the Lord, then we're supposed to be a giver. How do we know that? For God so loved the world that he gave. And so... Too many people in this world is gimme, 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 gimme. They're never satisfied. What they get, then they have to have a little bit more, a little bit more expensive, a little bit more fancier, a little bit more uh, gratuitous for them, and yet they're never satisfied. And so as believers, we can live a satisfied life by being ministers or channels to other people. Just like you said, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. So he commissioned them. Why? We are to take his place in this world. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Now we know that John 17 is 
is Jesus' high priestly prayer. So if you want to call this the Lord's Prayer, the true Lord's Prayer, this would be it. Verse 18 of John chapter 17 says this. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So we are to take his place. It's kind of like a, um, a race. And in, in about three weeks in Wichita, the best of the best runners of high school and those athletes are going to meet at Wichita State. And I always love watching that, especially Saturdays, because on that Saturday is when they have all the, the racing competitions. They start off with one, all the 1A students and the 2As and the 3As and 4As and 5As and 6A schools. And watching them when they're passing the baton, the speed the, and the cooperation and teamwork and how to deal with disappointment, how to deal with frustration. But the other way, what has a feel to win and they get the... The, the person grabs the students and say, what did it feel like to be able to get out of the block so fast? And what did it feel like to feel like you were behind someone and then you kicked it into another gear and all of a sudden you left everybody in the dust? And listening to their response, it's just amazing to listen to these young athletes. And the ones I'm impressed with the most, especially when it comes to team competition, where it's not just about them, is that if everyone didn't do their part, we wouldn't be in this situation. And the thing is this, is that every year, every four years, you have a new crew. And how do, how do teachers, how do coaches deal with it? They take that particular year and do the best of what they have, and they can't compare and say, well, if I had this person this year, we would be that much better this year compared to other years. You can't do all that stuff. You've got to take it every year, and you've got to take it with every competition um, for, for those particular, particular aspects. So Jesus is praying. He said, as I've been in the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And then also not only did he, we are to take his place in this world, but Jesus loves us as the Father loves him. Look at verse 26 of John 17. Verse 26 says this, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. So not only what he, he's, he's saying, I'm that's not stopping. I'm going to declare it, and I'm going to continue declaring it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So Jesus loves us as the Father loves him. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, look at verse 9. John 15, 9 says this. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. So when you just stop right there, I'm not done with reading that verse. But if you just think about that, he says, as the Father loved me, and that's a lot of love to Jesus, he says, he loves us with the same intense love that God loves him. Just let that sink in for a little bit. That's a lot of love. Then it says, Continue ye in my love. So not only are you going to receive it, but continue it, relish in it, live in it, and enjoy it, and then pass it on. And as the, the Christian fa family, the Christian family should be one that we are as believers acting as if Jesus was in the midst of us, and then ex modeling the example, and then we're, we're following after his example. So we see that <clears throat> Jesus loves us as the Father loves, loves him. But then also, look at John chapter 17, verse 21. John 17, 21 says this, that they all may be one. You know, God wants his believers to quit fighting with one another and be united. They all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I will give them, 
that they may be one, even as we are one. So we as believers are supposed to model that same behavior as Jesus and God are. That modeling, that example, the, um, the following through with the aspect of agape love. And there's three different, basically, types of love. You have the eros, which is the physical type of love. Then you have the, um, you ever have something on the top of your head that just kind of disappears? Then you, have, then you have a second love, which is a brotherly love. And then thirdly, which is agape, which is godly love. And so that's the type of love that God gives to us. So hold your place where you're at in John. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 4 and following. It says this. Charity suffereth long. Charity endures. Godly love endures and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity doesn't look at another person and say, well, it's not fair. They got that and I didn't get this. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity does say, look at me. Look how great I am. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Godly love will never take advantage of anybody else. We live in a world when they think about love, and they talk about love it's, instead of how can I minister to you, it's about what type of things can I take from you to gratify myself. That's the difference between the worldly love and godly love. And you see it everywhere as becoming even more uh, pr pronounced more now than ever before. Seeketh not her own. Godly love is more worried about other people than they are about themselves. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Godly love should be one that looks at a person and when you're wrong and says, you know what? I'm not going to revenge you because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Look at, hold your place here. We're going to go to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. If you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to do any type of ministry, you're going to deal with people that don't appreciate it or they're going to become vengeful because they mistake your actions and they take it as an attack on them instead of a correction on them. Uh, or they don't like things and so you become the object of their vengeance. It says in verse 17, says this, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be attacked verbally or, or uh, mentally. But it says, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment. You're going to have people that are going to curse you. You're going to have people that will say bad things about you. I have learned that in the ministry, not to have a tough hide but tender heart. You cannot serve Jesus living on eggshells and being constantly offended about everything. If you live your life on being offended... You might as well just go home, shut the doors, turn out the lights, and cover yourself up and hope and pray that nothing bad happens to you. Because if you live in this world, you're going to get offended. And the world today is becoming even more vindictive than ever before. And in their vindic vindication, they feel like, if I just get back at them, I'll feel better. I don't care about the response. If I can just get back at that person because they did me wrong or they said some wrong things or I didn't get what I wanted, then I'm going to feel better. And understand that if you're going to serve God, it's going to happen. But it says, And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the service of the Lord, and the righteousness of me, saith the Lord. This is the verse that we claimed many, many years ago, is that, as we serve God, that we understood that we were going to have verbal attacks through a variety of different issues and, and expect it. But we don't have to be vengeful against them because I belong to God. The heritage of the service of the Lord, God's going to take care of me. And I can promise you that God can exact vengeance on people that 
they won't be able to handle. My father-in-law. And it used to be, especially with the old-time preachers, um, if people talked bad about them, that they would, their voices would go. Just random. I know my father-in-law said he was up in, uh, I think it was in Yates Center or White City, which is up in that Circle High area. And um, there were some people that just really just verbally in the community starting to destroy his ministry verbally. Lies and attacks. And he just kept preaching, kept praying, doing what he was supposed to do. Next thing he knew, he'd heard about this person that was part of that verbal assault. All of a sudden, they couldn't talk. You know, got to take care of his people. And, you know, the old, old preachers, we're talking about the old circuit riding preachers, the ones that used to be able to preach the tent revivals, you say, don't get God in the killing mood. Because God will take care of his, his, his servants of the Lord. And so, as, as a believer, it's very easy, and as, as I've re related to you in the 19 years, that my response as a child, as a young adult, that I was always taught that um, my job is revenge. Thank God for the grace of God and Lucinda Fryer that has been held back a lot. And uh, I mean, just the very fact is that she would always tell me, let's look at this verse, let's pray over it, and let's go back to where it says in the book of Romans chapter 14, is vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will repay. Let's give it to God. Let's do the right thing, and let's just see, because if God takes care of them, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. And so we have seen it over and over and over again where God has always vindicated and taken care of anyone that's tried to destroy our lives or our ministry or our marriage. And so, um, and the Lord knew all that, and he knew what he was de dealing with as he's preparing his disciples because they were going to go into hostile environments and they better have an idea of what they're getting into and preparing them is that not to cower and run from, from serving the Lord, but you stand up, you speak up, you do what God tells you. And if they're, they become, they attack you, you just let them take care of it. And because I will make sure you're, you are taking care of the best way afterwards. You think about Stephen when he was being stoned, did he attack them? No. He just said, Father, you know, forgive them. That's right. And so, but who was one of the people that was part of Stephen Stoney? Paul was. He was literally holding his coat. Do you not think that that not, did not play on his mind? And God used that as he's going down the Damascus road. Do you not think that God used all that to remind Paul Hey, that servant of God that you helped kill, you're gonna be, you're gonna take his place. Because he did tell him that in during that time, during the vision it was given to him, that he was gonna have to stand before kings. He was gonna have to stand before other people. So the fact is this is that we are in the we are in the Father just as he is, is, that as he commissions us, we serve him and we follow him, then God takes care of the rest. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll end with this. Verse 5. So we're talking about godly love. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Godly love does not look at someone that is, that is dealing with despair and saying, it's about time God zapped them. They deserved it. That, I will tell you that's a tough one from my, from my background. But rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. And here's the hardest part. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And then you go to verse 13, it says this, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Not to minimize the other ones, 
but the one that, that puts it all together, ties it all up in a nice little bow, is godly love. And that's what God has given to us the moment we come to know Christ. Because Christ in us, this morning he's talking about Christ in us, the hope of glory. When we get saved, we get every part of God that we need in our lives. Even the ability to love when it's hard to love other people. And we're still a work in progress. And we're still, that process of endurance sometimes can get long, can get frustrating, and get to the point where you would say, Lord, I don't know if I can handle much more. God, you're going to have to rescue me because I'm about ready to go crazy on this situation. God always sees us through. Always. He has never let us down. That's called the love and grace and mercy of an almighty God. And so we learn about this resurrection and what he was trying to teach and impart to them because he knew that after a little while that they were going to endure a lot. Now they were going to have the mountaintop experience after the ascension where they were going to be praying for 10 days. Don't go nowhere, but don't leave that, that building until you're endued with power. They're endued with power. They all go out and they all preach. 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people get baptized. What a glorious time that, that was. Then all of a sudden persecution comes because they get satisfied where they're at. All of a sudden they get scattered. And then the gospel really starts spreading out throughout the world. And so it's through that persecution that through the starting of the churches, then that's where those disciples really be, had to lean on the, the lessons that Jesus was teaching during this time right here. I found out, and with this, I found that, that the lessons that I teach may not be for that particular moment, but I'm reminded through other circumstances later on during the week or later on the next week that things that I've said, God brings that back to memory for that particular moment. And kind of like with Esther, for such a time as this, God gives us what we need at the right time, at the right moment, for the right purpose. We serve an amazing God, don't we? Father, bless us as we uh, leave this place. Guide and direct our steps. And I pray whatever lesson was uh, meant for us to learn. Give us the ears to hear and help us to apply those things to our lives. Father, we're not sure what we're going to face this week. We just know that... Uh, it's coming. Whatever it is, you said we will, you will never leave us nor forsake us. Bless us, dear Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Brother Bob, you'll come and take up an offering, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss.